Chapter Ten of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A charming introduction to a hermit's life. Four weeks torture, tossing, and sickness. Oh, these bleak winds and bitter northern skies, and impassable roads and dilatory country surgeons, and oh, this dearth of the human physiognomy, and worse than all, the terrible intimation of Kenneth that I need not expect to be out of doors till spring. <sighs> Mr. Heathcliff has just honoured me with a call. About seven days ago he sent me a brace of grouse, the last of the season. Scoundrel! He is not altogether guiltless in this illness of mine, and that I had a great mind to tell him. But alas, how could I offend a man who was charitable enough to sit at my bedside a good hour, and talk on some subject other than pills and draughts, blisters and leeches? This is quite an easy interval. I am too weak to read, yet I feel as if I could enjoy something interesting. Why not have up Mrs. Dean to finish her tale? I can recollect its chief incidents, as far as she had gone. Yes, I remember her hero had run off, and never been heard of for three years, and the heroine was married. I'll ring. She'll be delighted to find me capable of talking cheerfully. Mrs. Dean came. It wants twenty minutes, sir, to taking the medicine. She commenced. Away, away with it, I replied. I desire to have... The doctor says you must drop the powders. With all my heart. Don't interrupt me. Come and take your seat here. Keep your finger from that bitter phalanx of vials. Draw your knitting out of your pocket. That will do. Now, continue the history of Mr. Heathcliff, from where you left off, to the present day. Did he finish his education on the continent, and come back a gentleman? Or did he get a sizer's place at college, or escape to America, and earn honours by drawing blood from his foster country, or make a fortune more promptly on the English highways? He may have done a little in all these vocations, Mr. Lockwood, but I couldn't give my word for any. I stated before that I didn't know how he gained his money, neither am I aware of the means he took to raise his mind from the savage ignorance into which it was sunk. But, with your leave, I'll proceed in my own fashion, if you think it will amuse and not weary you. Are you feeling better this morning? Much. That's good news. I got Miss Catherine and myself to Thrushcross Grange, and, to my agreeable disappointment, she behaved infinitely better than I dared to expect. She seemed almost over-fond of Mr. Linton, and even to his sister she showed plenty of affection. They were both very attentive to her comfort, certainly. It was not the thorn bending to the honeysuckles, but the honeysuckles embracing the thorn. There were no mutual concessions. One stood erect, the others yielded. And who can be ill-natured and bad-tempered when they encounter neither opposition nor indifference? I observed that Mr. Edgar had a deep-rooted fear of ruffling her humour. He concealed it from her, but if ever he heard me answer sharply, or saw any other servant grow cloudy at some imperious order of hers, he would show his trouble by a frown of displeasure that never darkened on his own account. He many a time spoke sternly to me about my pertness, and averred that the stab of a knife could not inflict a worse pang than he suffered at seeing his lady vexed. Not to grieve a kind master, I learned to be less touchy, and, for the space of half a year, the gunpowder lay as harmless as sand, because no fire came near to explode it. Catherine had seasons of gloom and silence now and then. They were respected with sympathising silence by her husband, who ascribed them to an alteration in her constitution, produced by her perilous illness, as she was never subject to depression of spirits before. The return of sunshine was welcomed by answering sunshine from him. I believe I may assert that they were really in possession of deep and growing happiness. It ended. Well, we must be for ourselves in the long run. The mild and generous are only more justly selfish than the domineering and it ended when circumstances caused each to feel that the one's interest was not the chief consideration in the other's thoughts. On a mellow evening in September, I was coming from the garden with a heavy basket of apples, which I had been gathering. It had got dusk, and the moon looked over the high wall of the court, causing undefined shadows to lurk in the corners of the numerous projecting portions of the building. I sat my burden on the house steps by the kitchen door, and lingered to rest, and drew in a few more breaths of the soft, sweet air. My eyes were on the moon, and my back to the entrance, when I heard a voice behind me say, 
Nelly, is that you? It was a deep voice, and foreign in tone, yet there was something in the manner of producing my name which made it sound familiar. I turned about to discover who spoke, fearfully, for the doors were shut, and I had seen nobody on approaching the steps. Something stirred in the porch, and, moving nearer, I distinguished a tall man dressed in dark clothes, with dark face and hair. He leant against the side, and held his fingers on the latch as if intending to open for himself. Who can it be? I thought. Mr. Earnshaw? Oh, no, the voice has no resemblance to his. I have waited here an hour, he resumed, while I continued staring. And the whole of that time all round has been as still as death. I dared not enter. You do not know me? Look, I am not a stranger. A ray fell on his features. The cheeks were sallow, and half covered with black whiskers, the brows lowering, the eyes deep-set and singular. I remembered the eyes. What? I cried, uncertain whether to regard him as a worldly visitor, and I raised my hands in amazement. What? You come back? Is it really you? Is it? Yes, Heathcliff, he replied, glancing from me up to the windows, which reflected a score of glittering moons, but showed no lights from within. Are they at home? Where is she? Nelly, you are not glad. You needn't be so disturbed. Is she here? Speak. I want to have one word with her, your mistress. Go and say some person from Gimmerton desires to see her. How will she take it? I exclaimed. What will she do? The surprise bewilders me. It will put her out of her head. And you are Heathcliff, but altered. Nay, there's no comprehending it. Have you been for a soldier? Go and carry my message, he interrupted impatiently. I'm in hell till you do. He lifted the latch, and I entered, but when I got to the parlour where Mr. and Mrs. Linton were, I could not persuade myself to proceed. At length I resolved on making an excuse to ask if they would have the candles lighted, and I opened the door. They sat together in a window whose lattice lay back against the wall, and displayed, beyond the garden trees and the wild green park, the valley of Gimmerton, with a long line of mist winding nearly to its top. For very soon after you pass the chapel, as you may have noticed, the sow that runs from the marshes joins a beck which follows the bend of the glen. Wuthering heights rose above this silvery vapour, but our old house was invisible. It rather dips down on the other side. Both the room and its occupants, and the scene they gazed on, looked wondrously peaceful. I shrank reluctantly from performing my errand, and was actually going away, leaving it unsaid, after having put my question about the candles, when a sense of my folly compelled me to return, and mutter, "'A person from Gimmerton wishes to see you, ma'am.' "'What does he want?' asked Mrs. Lenton. "'I did not question him.' I answered. "'Well, close the curtains, Nellie,' she said, "'and bring up tea. I'll be back again directly.' She quitted the apartment. Mr. Edgar inquired carelessly who it was. "'Someone mistress does not expect,' I replied. "'That Heathcliff, you recollect him, sir, who used to live at Mr. Earnshaw's.' "'What? The gypsy? The ploughboy?' he cried. "'Why did you not say so, Catherine?' "'Hush! You must not call him by those names, Muster, I said. She'd be sadly grieved to hear you. She was nearly heartbroken when he ran off. I guess his return will make a jubilee to her. Mr. Linton walked to a window on the other side of the room that overlooked the court. He unfastened it and leant out. I suppose they were below, for he exclaimed quickly, Don't stand there, love. Bring the person in, if it be any one particular. Ere long I heard the click of the latch, and Catherine flew upstairs, breathless and wild, too excited to show gladness. Indeed, by her face you would rather have surmised an awful calamity. "'Oh, Edgar! Edgar!' she panted, flinging her arms round his neck. "'Oh, Edgar, darling! Heathcliff's come back! He is!' And she tightened her embrace to a squeeze. "'Well, well,' cried her husband crossly. "'Don't strangle me for that!' He never struck me as such a marvellous treasure. There's no need to be frantic. I know you didn't like him, she answered, repressing a little intensity of her delight. Yet, for my sake, you must be friends now. Shall I tell him to come up? Here, he said. Into the parlour. Where else? she asked. 
he looked vexed and suggested the kitchen as a more suitable place for him. Mrs. Linton eyed him with a droll expression, half angry, half laughing at his fastidiousness. No, she added, after a while. I cannot sit in the kitchen. Set two tables here, Ellen, one for your master and Miss Isabella, being gentry, the other for Heathcliff and myself, being of the lower orders. Will that please you, dear? Or must I have a fire lighted elsewhere? If so, give directions. I'll run down and secure my guest. I'm afraid the joy is too great to be real. She was about to dart off again, but Edgar arrested her. You bid him step up, he said, addressing me. And, Catherine, try to be glad without being absurd. The whole household need not witness the sight of your welcoming a runaway servant as a brother. I descended and found Heathcliff waiting under the porch, evidently anticipating an invitation to enter. He followed my guidance without waste of words, and I ushered him into the presence of the master and mistress, whose flushed cheeks betrayed signs of warm talking. But the ladies glowed with another feeling when her friend appeared at the door. She sprang forward, took both his hands, and led him to Linton, and then she seized Linton's reluctant fingers and crushed them into his. Now fully revealed by the fire and candlelight, I was amazed more than ever to behold the transformation of Heathcliff. He had grown a tall, athletic, well-formed man, beside whom my master seemed quite slender and youth-like. His upright carriage suggested the idea of his having been in the army. His countenance was much older in expression and decision of feature than Mr. Linton's. It looked intelligent, and retained no marks of former degradation. A half-civilised ferocity lurked yet in the depressed brows and eyes full of black fire, but it was subdued, and his manner was even dignified, quite divested of roughness, though stern for grace. My master's surprise equalled or exceeded mine. He remained for a minute at a loss how to address the ploughboy, as he had called him. Heathcliff dropped his slight hand, and stood looking at him coolly till he chose to speak. "'Sit down, sir,' he said at length. Mrs. Linton, recalling old times, would have me give you a cordial reception. And of course I am gratified when anything occurs to please her. And I also, answered Heathcliff, especially if it be anything in which I have a part. I shall stay an hour or two willingly. He took a seat opposite Catherine, who kept her gaze fixed on him as if she feared he would vanish were she to remove it. He did not wish to raise his to her often. A quick glance now and then sufficed, but it flashed back, each time more confidently, the undisguised delight he drank from hers. They were too much absorbed in their mutual joy to suffer embarrassment. Not so, Mr. Edgar. He grew pale with pure annoyance, a feeling that reached its climax when his lady rose, and, stepping across the rug, seized Heathcliff's hands again and laughed like one beside herself. "'I shall think it a dream to-morrow,' she cried. I shall not be able to believe that I have seen, and touched, and spoken to you once more. And yet, cruel Heathcliff, you don't deserve this welcome. To be absent and silent for three years, and never to think of me. A little more than you have thought of me, he murmured. I heard of your marriage, Cathy, not long since, and while waiting in the yard below I meditated this plan, just to have one glimpse of your face, a stare of surprise, perhaps, and pretended pleasure, afterwards settle my score with Hindley, and then prevent the law by doing execution on myself. Your welcome has put these ideas out of my mind, but beware of meeting me with another aspect next time. Nay, you'll not drive me off again. You were really sorry for me, were you? Well, there was cause. I've fought through a bitter life since I last heard your voice, and you must forgive me, for I struggled only for you. Catherine, unless we are to have cold tea, please come to the table, interrupted Linton, striving to preserve his ordinary tone and a due measure of politeness. Mr. Heathcliff will have a long walk, wherever he may lodge to-night, and I'm thirsty. She took her post before the urn, and Miss Isabella came, summoned by the bell. Then, having handed the chairs forward, I left the room. The meal hardly endured ten minutes. Catherine's cup was never filled. She could neither eat nor drink. Edgar had made a slop in his saucer, and scarcely swallowed a mouthful. Their guest did not protract his stay that evening above an hour longer. I asked, as he departed, if he went to Gimmerton. 
no to wuthering heights he answered mr earnshaw invited me when i called this morning mr earnshaw invited him and he called on mr earnshaw i pondered this sentence painfully after he was gone is he turning out a bit of a hypocrite and coming to the country to work mischief under a cloak i mused i had a presentiment in the bottom of my heart that he had better have remained away about the middle of the night i was awakened from my first nap by mrs linton gliding into my chamber taking a seat on my bedside and pulling me by the hair to rouse me i cannot rest ellen she said by way of apology and i want some living creature to keep me company in my happiness edgar is sulky because i am glad of a thing that does not interest him he refuses to open his mouth except to utter pettish silly speeches and he affirmed i was cruel and selfish for wishing to talk when he was so sick and sleepy he always contrives to be sick at the least cross i gave a few sentences of commendation to heathcliff and he either for a headache or a pang of envy began to cry so i got up and left him what use is it praising heathcliff to him i answered as lads they had an aversion to each other and heathcliff would hate just as much to hear him praised it's human nature let mr linton alone about him unless you would like an open quarrel between them but does it not show great weakness pursued she i'm not envious i never feel hurt at the brightness of isabella's yellow hair and the whiteness of her skin at her dainty elegance and the fondness all the family exhibit for her even you nelly if we have a dispute sometimes you back isabella at once and i yield like a foolish mother i call her a darling and flatter her into a good temper it pleases her brother to see us cordial and that pleases me but they are very much alike they are spoiled children and fancy the world was made for their accommodation and though i humour both i think a smart chastisement might improve them all the same you're mistaken mrs linton said i they humour you i know what there would be to do if they did not you can well afford to indulge their passing whims as long as their business is to anticipate all your desires you may however fall out at last over something of equal consequence to both sides and then those you term weak are very capable of being as obstinate as you and then we shall fight to the death shan't we nelly she returned laughing no i tell you i have such faith in linton's love that i believe i might kill him and he wouldn't wish to retaliate i advised her to value him the more for his affection i do she answered but he needn't resort to whining for trifles it is childish and instead of melting into tears because i said that heathcliff was now worthy of any one's regard and it would honour the first gentleman in the country to be his friend he ought to have said it for me in being delighted from sympathy he must get accustomed to him and he may as well like him considering how heathcliff has reason to object to him i'm sure he behaved excellently what do you think of his going to wuthering heights i inquired he is reformed in every respect apparently quite a christian offering the right hand of fellowship to his enemies all around he explained it she replied i wonder as much as you he said he called to gather information concerning me from you supposing you resided there still and joseph told hindley who came out and fell to questioning him of what he had been doing and how he had been living and finally desired him to walk in there were some persons sitting at cards heathcliff joined them my brother lost some money to him and finding him plentifully supplied he requested that he would come again in the evening to which he consented hindley is too reckless to select his acquaintance prudently he doesn't trouble himself to reflect on the causes he might have for mistrusting one whom he has basely injured but heathcliff affirms his principal reason for resuming a connection with his ancient persecutor is a wish to install himself in quarters at walking distance from the grange and an attachment to the house where we live together and likewise a hope that i shall have more opportunities of seeing him there than i could have if he settled in gimmerton he means to offer liberal payment for permission to lodge at the heights and doubtless my brother's covetousness will prompt him to accept the terms he was always greedy though what he grasps with one hand he flings away with the other it's a nice place for a young man to fix his dwelling in said i have you no fear of the consequences mrs linton none for my friend 
she replied. His strong head will keep him from danger. A little for Hinley, but he can't be made morally worse than he is, and I stand between him and bodily harm. The event of this evening has reconciled me to God and humanity. I had risen in angry rebellion against Providence. Oh, I've endured very, very bitter misery, Nelly. If that creature knew how bitter, he'd be ashamed to cloud its removal with idle petulance. It was kindness for him which induced me to bear it alone. Had I expressed the agony I frequently felt, he would have been taught to long for its alleviation as ardently as I. However, it's over, and I'll take no revenge on his folly. I can afford to suffer anything hereafter. Should the meanest thing alive slap me on the cheek, I'd not only turn the other, but I'd ask pardon for provoking it. And, as a proof, I'll go make my peace with Edgar instantly. Good night. I'm an angel. In this self-complacent conviction she departed, and the success of her fulfilled resolution was obvious on the morrow. Mr. Linton had not only abjured his peevishness, though his spirits seemed still subdued by Catherine's exuberance of vivacity, but he ventured no objection to her taking Isabella with her to Wuthering Heights in the afternoon, and she rewarded him with such a summer of sweetness and affection in return as made the house a paradise for several days, both master and servants profiting from the perpetual sunshine. Heathcliff, Mr. Heathcliff, I should say in future, used the liberty of visiting at Thrushcross Grange cautiously at first. He seemed estimating how far its owner would bear his intrusion. Catherine also deemed it judicious to moderate her expressions of pleasure in receiving him, and he gradually established his right to be expected. He retained a great deal of the reserve for which his boyhood was remarkable, and that served to repress all startling demonstrations of feeling. My master's uneasiness experienced a lull, and further circumstances diverted it into another channel for a space. His new source of trouble sprang from the not-anticipated misfortune of Isabella Linton evincing a sudden and irresistible attraction towards the tolerated guest. She was at that time a charming young lady of eighteen, infantile in manners, though possessed of keen wit, keen feelings, and a keen temper too, if irritated. Her brother, who loved her tenderly, was appalled at this fantastic preference. Leaving aside the degradation of an alliance with a nameless man, and the possible fact that his property, in default of heirs male, might pass into such a one's power, he had sense to comprehend Heathcliff's disposition. To know that, though his exterior was altered, his mind was unchangeable and unchanged. And he dreaded that mind. It revolted him. He shrank forebodingly from the idea of committing Isabella to its keeping. He would have recoiled still more had he been aware that her attachment rose unsolicited, and was bestowed where it awakened no reciprocation of sentiment. For the minute he discovered its existence, he laid the blame on Heathcliff's deliberate designing. We had all remarked, during some time, that Miss Linton fretted and pined over something. She grew cross and wearisome, snapping at and teasing Catherine continually, at the imminent risk of exhausting her limited patience. We excused her, to a certain extent, on the plea of ill health. She was dwindling and fading before our eyes. But one day, when she had been peculiarly wayward, rejecting her breakfast, complaining that the servants did not do what she told them, that the mistress would allow her to be nothing in the house, and Edgar neglected her, that she had caught a cold with the doors being left open, and we let the parlour fire go out on purpose to vex her, with a hundred yet more frivolous accusations. Mrs. Linton peremptorily insisted that she should get to bed, and, having scolded her heartily, threatened to send for the doctor. Mention of Kenneth caused her to exclaim instantly that her health was perfect, and it was only Catherine's harshness which made her unhappy. "'How can you say I am harsh, you naughty fondling?' cried the mistress, amazed at the unreasonable assertion. "'You are surely losing your reason. When have I been harsh, tell me?' "'Yesterday,' sobbed Isabella. "'And now?' "'Yesterday?' said her sister-in-law. "'On what occasion?' "'In our walk along the moor. You told me to ramble where I pleased while you sauntered on with Mr. Heathcliff.' "'And <laughs> that's your notion of harshness?' said Catherine, laughing. "'It was no hint that your company was superfluous. We didn't care whether you kept with us or not. I merely thought Heathcliff's talk would have nothing entertaining for your ears.' "'Oh, no!' wept the young lady. 
You wished me away because you knew I liked to be there. Is she sane? asked Mrs. Linton, appealing to me. I'll repeat our conversation, word for word, Isabella, and you point out any charm it could have had for you. I don't mind the conversation, she answered. I wanted to be with— Well, said Catherine, perceiving her hesitate to complete the sentence. With him, and I won't be always sent off, she continued, kindling up. You are a dog in the manger, Cathy, and desire no one to be loved but yourself. You are an impertinent little monkey, exclaimed Mrs. Linton in surprise. But I'll not believe this idiocy. It is impossible that you can covet the admiration of Heathcliff, that you consider him an agreeable person. I hope I have misunderstood you, Isabella. No, you have not, said the infatuated girl. I love him more than ever you loved Edgar, and he might love me if you would let him. I wouldn't be you for a kingdom, then, Catherine declared emphatically and she seemed to speak sincerely. Nellie, help me to convince her of her madness. Tell her what Heathcliff is, an unreclaimed creature, without refinement, without cultivation, an arid wilderness of firs and windstone. I'd as soon put that little canary into the park on a winter's day as recommend you to bestow your heart on him. It is deplorable ignorance of his character, child, and nothing else which makes that dream enter your head. Pray don't imagine that he conceals depths of benevolence and affection beneath a stern exterior. He's not a rough diamond, a pearl containing oyster of a rustic. He's a fierce, pitiless, wolfish man. I never say to him, let this or that enemy alone, because it would be ungenerous or cruel to harm them. I say, let them alone, because I should hate them to be wronged. And he'd crush you like a sparrow's egg, Isabella." if he found you a troublesome charge. I know he couldn't love a Linton, and yet he'd be quite capable of marrying your fortune and expectations. Avarice is growing with him a besetting sin. There's my picture, and I'm his friend, so much so that had he thought seriously to catch you, I should perhaps have held my tongue and let you fall into his trap. Mrs. Linton regarded her sister-in-law with indignation. "'For shame! For shame!' she repeated angrily. "'You are worse than twenty foes, you poisonous friend!' "'Ah! You won't believe me, then?' said Catherine. "'You think I speak from wicked selfishness?' "'I'm certain you do,' retorted Isabella. "'And I shudder at you.' "'Good!' cried the other. "'Try for yourself, if that be your spirit. I have done, and yield the argument to your saucy insolence.' "'And I must suffer for her egotism,' she sobbed, as Mrs. Linton left the room. "'All, all is against me. She has blighted my single consolation. But she uttered falsehoods, didn't she? Mr. Heathcliff is not a fiend. He has an honourable soul and a true one, or how could he remember her?' "'Banish him from your thoughts, miss,' I said. "'He's a bird of bad omen, no mate for you.' Mrs. Linton spoke strongly, and yet I can't contradict her. She is better acquainted with his heart than I, or any one besides, and she never would represent him as worse than he is. Honest people don't hide their deeds. How has he been living? How has he got rich? Why is he staying at Wuthering Heights, the house of a man whom he abhors? They say Mr. Earnshaw is worse and worse since he came. They sit up all night together continually, and Hindley has been borrowing money on his land, and does nothing but play and drink. I heard only a week ago it was Joseph who told me. I met him at Gimmerton. Nelly, he said, we hees a crown a quest you know at our folks. One on them, sir, a getting his finger cut off with hoiding to other fro sticking his sound like a calf. That's maister, you know, at so a up a going to the grand sizes. He's known feared at a bench of judges, nor at a Paul. Nor Peter, nor John, nor Matthew, nor none on them, not he. He fair likes, he longs to set his brazen face again him. And yon bonny lad, Heathcliff, ye mind, he's a rare un. He can go and laugh as well as anybody at a right devil's gist. Does he never see no to his fine living among us when he goes to the Grange? This is the way, aunt, or oh, put sundown. Dice, brandy, cloy shutters, 
and kind light till next day at noon then to foil gang's banning and raving to his chamber making decent folks dig their fingers in their lugs for very shame on the nave where ye can keep his brass and eat and sleep and off to his neighbours to gossip with the wife he cause he tells him catherine how her father's gold runs into his pocket and her father's son gallops down to broad road while he flees afore to open to pikes now miss linton joseph is an old rascal but no liar and if his account of heathcliff's conduct be true you would never think of desiring such a husband would you you are leagued with the rest ellen she replied i'll not listen to your slanders what malevolence you must have to wish to convince me that there is no happiness in the world whether she would have got over this fancy if left to herself or persevered in nursing it perpetually i cannot say she had little time to reflect the day after there was a justice meeting at the next town my master was obliged to attend and mr heathcliff aware of his absence called rather earlier than usual catherine and isabella were sitting in the library on hostile terms but silent the latter alarmed at her recent indiscretion and the disclosure she had made of her secret feelings in a transient fit of passion the former on mature consideration really offended with her companion and if she laughed again at her pertness inclined to make it no laughing matter to her she did laugh as she saw heathcliff pass the window i was sweeping the hearth and i noticed a mischievous smile on her lips isabella absorbed in her meditations or a book remained till the door opened and it was too late to attempt an escape which she would gladly have done had it been practicable come in that's right exclaimed the mistress gaily pulling a chair to the fire here are two people sadly in need of a third to thaw the ice between them and you are the very one we should both of us choose heathcliff i'm proud to show you at last somebody that dotes on you more than myself i expect you to feel flattered nay it's not nelly don't look at her my poor little sister-in-law is breaking her heart by mere contemplation of your physical and moral beauty it lies in your own power to be edgar's brother no no isabella you shan't run off she continued arresting with feigned playfulness the confounded girl who had risen indignantly we were quarrelling like cats about you heathcliff and i was fairly beaten in protestations of devotion and admiration and moreover i was informed that if i would but have the manners to stand aside my rival as she will have herself to be would shoot a shaft into your soul that would fix you for ever and send my image into eternal oblivion catherine said isabella calling up her dignity and disdaining to struggle from the tight grasp that held her i thank you to adhere to the truth and not slander me even in joke mr heathcliff be kind enough to bid this friend of yours release me she forgets that you and i are not intimate acquaintances and what amuses her is painful to me beyond expression as the guest answered nothing but took his seat and looked thoroughly indifferent what sentiments she cherished concerning him she turned and whispered an earnest appeal for liberty to her tormentor by no means cried mrs linton in answer i won't be named a dog in the manger again you shall stay now then heathcliff why don't you evince satisfaction at my pleasant news isabella swears that the love edgar has for me is nothing to that she entertains for you i'm sure she made some speech of the kind did she not ellen and she has fasted ever since the day before yesterday's walk from sorrow and rage that i dispatched her out of your society under the idea of its being unacceptable i think you belie her said heathcliff twisting his chair to face them she wishes to be out of my society now at any rate and he stared hard at the object of discourse as one might do at a strange repulsive animal a centipede from the indies for instance which curiosity leads one to examine in spite of the aversion it raises the poor thing couldn't bear that she grew white and red in rapid succession and while the tears beaded her lashes bent the strength of her small fingers to loosen the firm clutch of catherine and perceiving that as fast as she raised one finger off her arm another closed down and she could not remove the whole together she began to make use of her nails and their sharpness presently ornamented the detainers with crescents of red there's a tigress exclaimed mrs linton setting her free and shaking her hand with pain be gone for god's sake and hide your vixen face 
how foolish to reveal those talents to him can't you fancy the conclusions he'll draw look heathcliff there are instruments that will do execution you must beware of your eyes i'd wrench them off her fingers if they ever menaced me he answered brutally when the door had closed after her but what did you mean by teasing the creature in that manner cathy you were not speaking the truth were you i assure you i was she returned she has been dying for your sake several weeks and raving about you this morning and pouring forth a deluge of abuse because i represented your failings in a plain light for the purpose of mitigating her adoration but don't notice it further i wish to punish her sauciness that's all i like her too well my dear heathcliff to let you absolutely seize and devour her up and i like her too ill to attempt it said he except in a very ghoulish fashion you'd hear of odd things if i lived alone with that mawkish waxen face the most ordinary would be painting on its white the colours of the rainbow and turning the blue eyes black every day or two they detestably resemble lintons delectably observed catherine they are dove's eyes angels she's her brother's heir is she not he asked after a brief silence i should be sorry to think so returned his companion half a dozen nephews shall erase her title please heaven abstract your mind from the subject at present you are too prone to covet your neighbour's goods remember this neighbour's goods are mine if they were mine they would be none the less that said heathcliff but though isabella linton may be silly she is scarcely mad and in short we'll dismiss the matter as you advise from their tongues they did dismiss it and catherine probably from her thoughts the other i felt certain recalled it often in the course of the evening i saw him smile to himself grin rather and lapse into ominous musing whenever mrs linton had occasion to be absent from the apartment i determined to watch his movements my heart invariably cleaved to the master's in preference to catherine's side with reason i imagined for he was kind and trustful and honourable and she she could not be called opposite yet she seemed to allow herself such wide latitude that i had little faith in her principles and still less sympathy for her feelings i wanted something to happen which might have the effect of freeing both wuthering heights and the grange of mr heathcliff quietly leaving us as we had been prior to his advent his visits were a continual nightmare to me and i suspected to my master also his abode at the heights was an oppression past explaining i felt that god had forsaken the stray sheep there to its own wicked wanderings and an evil beast prowled between it and the fold waiting his time to spring and destroy end of chapter ten chapter eleven of wuthering heights by emily bronte this librivox recording is in the public domain sometimes while meditating on these things in solitude i've got up in a sudden terror and put on my bonnet to go see how all was at the farm i've persuaded my conscience that it was a duty to warn him how people talked regarding his ways and then i've recollected his confirmed bad habits and hopeless of benefiting him have flinched from re-entering the dismal house doubting if i could bear to be taken at my word one time i passed the old gate going out of my way on a journey to gimmerton it was about the period that my narrative has reached a bright frosty afternoon the ground bare and the road hard and dry i came to a stone where the highway branches off on to the moor at your left hand a rough sand pillar with the letters w h cut on its north side on the east g and on the south-west t g it serves as a guide-post to the grange the heights and the village the sun shone yellow on its grey head reminding me of summer and i cannot say why but all at once a gush of child sensations flowed into my heart hindley and i held it a favourite spot twenty years before i gazed long at the weather-worn block and stooping down perceived a hole near the bottom still full of snail-shells and pebbles which we were fond of storing there with more perishable things and as fresh as reality it appeared that i beheld my early playmate seated on the withered turf his dark square head bent forward 
and his little hand scooping out the earth with a piece of slate. "'Poor Hindley!' I exclaimed involuntarily. I started, my bodily eye was cheated into a momentary belief that the child lifted its face and stared straight into mine. It vanished in a twinkling, but immediately I felt an irresistible yearning to be at the heights. Superstition urged me to comply with this impulse, supposing he should be dead, I thought, or should die soon, supposing it were a sign of death. The nearer I got to the house the more agitated I grew, and on catching sight of it I trembled in every limb. The apparition had outstripped me. It stood, looking through the gate. That was my first idea on observing an elf-locked, brown-eyed boy setting his ruddy countenance against the bars. Further reflection suggested this must be Hareton, my Hareton, not altered greatly since I left him ten months since. "'God bless thee, darling!' I cried, forgetting instantaneously my foolish fears. "'Hareton, it's Nelly, Nelly, thy nurse!' He retreated out of arm's length and picked up a large flint. "'I am come to see thy father, Hareton,' I added, guessing from the action that Nelly, if she lived in his memory at all, was not recognised as one with me. He raised his missile to hurl it. I commenced a soothing speech, but could not stay his hand. The stone struck my bonnet, and then ensued from the stammering lips of the little fellow a string of curses, which, whether he comprehended them or not, were delivered with practised emphasis, and distorted his baby features into a shocking expression of malignity. You may be certain this grieved more than angered me. Fit to cry, I took an orange from my pocket, and offered it to propitiate him. He hesitated, and then snatched it from my hold, as if he fancied I only intended to tempt him and disappoint him. I showed another, keeping it out of his reach. "'Who has taught you those fine words, my bairn?' I inquired. "'The curate.' "'Damn the curate and thee. Give me that,' he replied. "'Tell us where you got your lessons, and you shall have it.' said I. Who's your master? Devil Daddy, was his answer. And what do you learn from Daddy? I continued. He jumped at the fruit. I raised it higher. What does he teach you? I asked. Nought, said he. But to keep out of his gate. Daddy cannot bide me because I swear at him. Ah, oh, and the devil teaches you to swear at Daddy, I observed. Aye. Nay, he drawled. Who then? Heathcliff. I asked if he liked Mr. Heathcliff. Aye, he answered again. Desiring to have his reasons for liking him, I could only gather the sentences. Ah, not. He pays Dad back what he gives to me. He curses Daddy for cursing me. He says I'm on do as I will. And the curate does not teach you to read and write, then, I pursued. No, I was told the curate should have his teeth dashed down his throat if he stepped over the threshold. Heathcliff had promised that. I put the orange in his hand, and bade him tell his father that a woman called Nellie Dean was wanting to speak with him by the garden gate. He went up the walk, and entered the house, but, instead of Hindley, Heathcliff appeared on the doorstones, and I turned directly and ran down the road as hard as ever I could race, making no halt till I gained the guide-post, and feeling as scared as if I had raised a goblin. This is not much connected with Miss Isabella's affair, except that it urged me to resolve further on mounting vigilant guard, and doing my utmost to check the spread of such bad influence at the Grange, even though I should wake a domestic storm by thwarting Mrs. Linton's pleasure. The next time Heathcliff came, my young lady chanced to be feeding some pigeons in the court. She had never spoken a word to her sister-in-law for three days, but she had likewise dropped her fretful complaining, and we found it a great comfort. Heathcliff had not the habit of bestowing a single unnecessary civility on Miss Linton, I knew. Now, as soon as he beheld her, his first precaution was to take a sweeping survey of the house-front. I was standing by the kitchen window, but I drew out of sight. He then stepped across the pavement to her, and said something. She seemed embarrassed, and desirous of getting away. To prevent it, he laid his hand on her arm. She averted her face. He apparently put some question which she had no mind to answer. There was another rapid glance at the house, and, supposing himself unseen, the scoundrel had the impudence to embrace her. "'Judas! Traitor!' I ejaculated. "'You are a hypocrite, too, are you? A deliberate deceiver!' "'Who is, Nellie? said Catherine's voice at my elbow. I had been over-intent on watching the pair outside to mark her entrance. 
"'Your worthless friend,' I answered warmly. "'The sneaking rascal yonder. "'Ah, he has caught a glimpse of us. "'He is coming in. "'I wonder will he have the heart to find a plausible excuse "'for making love to Miss, when he told you he hated her.' Mrs. Linton saw Isabella tear herself free and run into the garden, and a minute after Heathcliff opened the door. I couldn't withhold giving some loose to my indignation, but Catherine angrily insisted on silence, and threatened to order me out of the kitchen, if I dared to be so presumptuous as to put in my insolent tongue. "'To hear you, people might think you were the mistress,' she cried. "'You want setting down in your right place. Heathcliff, what are you about, raising this stir?' I said you must let Isabella alone. I beg you will, unless you are tired of being received here, and wish Linton to draw the bolts against you. God forbid that he should try, answered the black villain. I detested him just then. God keep him meek and patient. Every day I grow madder after sending him to heaven. Hush, said Catherine, shutting the inner door. Don't vex me. Why have you disregarded my request? Did she come across you on purpose? what is it to you he growled i have a right to kiss her if she chooses and you have no right to object i am not your husband you needn't be jealous of me i'm not jealous of you replied the mistress i'm jealous for you clear your face you shan't scowl at me if you like isabella you shall marry her but do you like her tell the truth heathcliff there you won't answer i'm certain you don't and would Mr. Linton approve of his sister marrying that man? I inquired. Mr. Linton should approve, returned my lady decisively. He might spare himself the trouble, said Heathcliff. I could do as well without his approbation. And as to you, Catherine, I have a mind to speak a few words now while we are at it. I want you to be aware that I know you have treated me infernally, infernally, do you hear? And if you flatter yourself that I don't perceive it, you are a fool and if you think I can be consoled by sweet words, you are an idiot, and if you fancy I'll suffer unrevenged, I'll convince you of the contrary in a very little while. Meantime, thank you for telling me your sister-in-law's secret. I swear I'll make the most of it, and stand you aside. What new phase of his character is this? exclaimed Mrs. Linton in amazement. I've treated you infernally, and you'll take your revenge? How will you take it, ungrateful brute? How have I treated you infernally? I seek no revenge on you, replied Heathcliff less vehemently. That's not the plan. The tyrant grinds down his slaves, and they don't turn against him. They crush those beneath them. You are welcome to torture me to death for your amusement. Only allow me to amuse myself a little in the same style, and refrain from insult as much as you are able. Having levelled my palace, don't erect a hovel and complacently admire your own charity in giving me that for a home. If I imagined you really wished me to marry Isabel, I'd cut my throat. Oh, the evil is that I am not jealous, is it? cried Catherine. Well, I won't repeat my offer of a wife. It is as bad as offering Satan a lost soul. Your bliss lies, like his, in inflicting misery. You prove it. Edgar is restored from the ill temper he gave way to at your coming. I begin to be secure and tranquil, and you, restless to know us at peace, appear resolved on exciting a quarrel. Quarrel with Edgar, if you please, Heathcliff, and deceive his sister. You'll hit on exactly the most efficient method of revenging yourself on me. The conversation ceased. Mrs. Linton sat down by the fire, flushed and gloomy. The spirit which served her was growing intractable, she could neither lay nor control it. He stood on the hearth with folded arms, brooding on his evil thoughts, and in this position I left them to seek the master, who was wondering what kept Catherine below so long. Ellen, said he, when I entered. Have you seen your mistress? Yes, she's in the kitchen, sir, I answered. She's sadly put out by Mr. Heathcliff's behaviour, and indeed I do think it's time to arrange his visits on another footing. There's harm in being too soft, and now it's come to this— and I related the scene in the court, and, as near as I dared, the whole subsequent dispute. I fancied it could not be very prejudicial to Mrs. Linton, unless she made so afterwards, by assuming the defensive for her guest. Edgar Linton had difficulty in hearing me to the close. His first words revealed that he did not clear his wife of blame. "'This is insufferable,' he exclaimed. "'It is disgraceful that she should own him for a friend, and force his company on me.' 
call me two men out of the hall ellen catherine shall linger no longer to argue with the low ruffian i have humoured her enough he descended and bidding the servants wait in the passage went followed by me to the kitchen its occupants had recommenced their angry discussion mrs linton at least was scolding with renewed vigour heathcliff had moved to the window and hung his head somewhat cowed by her violent rating apparently he saw the master first and made a hasty motion that she should be silent which she obeyed abruptly on discovering the reason of his intimation how is this said linton addressing her what notion of propriety must you have to remain here after the language which has been held to you by that blackguard i suppose because it is his ordinary talk you think nothing of it you are habituated to his baseness and perhaps imagine that i can get used to it too have you been listening at the door edgar asked the mistress in a tone particularly calculated to provoke her husband implying both carelessness and contempt for his irritation heathcliff who had raised his eyes at the former speech gave a sneering laugh at the latter on purpose it seemed to draw mr linton's attention to him he succeeded but edgar did not mean to entertain him with any high flights of passion i have been so far forbearing with you sir he said quietly not that i was ignorant of your miserable degraded character but i felt you were only partly responsible for that and catherine wishing to keep up your acquaintance i acquiesced foolishly your presence is a moral poison that would contaminate the most virtuous for that cause and to prevent worse consequences i shall deny you hereafter admission into this house and give notice now that i require your instant departure three minutes delay will render it involuntary and ignominious heathcliff measured the height and breadth of the speaker with an eye full of derision cathy this lamb of yours threatens like a bull he said it is in danger of splitting its skull against my knuckles by god mr linton i am mortally sorry that you are not worth knocking down my master glanced towards the passage and signed me to fetch the men he had no intention of hazarding a personal encounter i obeyed the hint but mrs linton suspecting something followed and when i attempted to call them she pulled me back slammed the door to and locked it fair means she said in answer to her husband's look of angry surprise if you have not courage to attack him make an apology or allow yourself to be beaten it will correct you of feigning more valour than you possess no i'll swallow the key before you shall get it i'm delightfully rewarded for my kindness to each after constant indulgence of one's weak nature and the other's bad one i earn for thanks two samples of blind ingratitude stupid to absurdity edgar i was defending you and yours and i wish heathcliff may flog you sick for daring to think an evil thought of me it did not need the medium of a flogging to produce that effect on the master he tried to wrest the key from catherine's grasp and for safety she flung it to the hottest part of the fire whereupon mr edgar was taken with a nervous trembling and his countenance grew deadly pale for his life he could not avert that excess of emotion mingled anguish and humiliation overcame him completely he leant on the back of a chair and covered his face oh heavens in old days this would win you knighthood exclaimed mrs linton we are vanquished we are vanquished heathcliff would as soon lift a finger at you as the king would march his army against a colony of mice cheer up you shan't be hurt your type is not a lamb it's a sucking leveret i wish you joy of the milk-blooded coward cathy said her friend i compliment you on your taste and that is the slavering shivering thing you preferred to me i would not strike him with my fist but i'd kick him with my foot and experience considerable satisfaction is he weeping or is he going to faint for fear the fellow approached and gave the chair on which linton rested a push he'd better have kept his distance my master quickly sprang erect and struck him full on the throat with a blow that would have levelled a slighter man it took his breath for a minute and while he choked mr linton walked out by the back door into the yard and from thence to the front entrance there you've done with coming here cried catherine get away now he'll return with a brace of pistols and half a dozen assistants if he did overhear us of course he'd never forgive you you've played me an ill turn heathcliff but go make haste i'd rather see edgar at bay than you do you suppose i'm going with that blow burning in my gullet he thundered by hell no i'll crush his ribs in like a rotten hazelnut before i cross the threshold if i don't floor him now i shall murder him some time so as you value his existence let me get at him 
He is not coming, I interposed, framing a bit of a lie. There's the coachman and the two gardeners. You'll surely not wait to be thrust into the road by them. Each has a bludgeon, and Master will very likely be watching from the parlour windows to see that they fulfil his orders. The gardeners and the coachman were there, but Linton was with them. They had already entered the court. Heathcliff, on the second thoughts, resolved to avoid a struggle against three underlings. He seized the poker, smashed the lock from the inner door, and made his escape as they tramped in. Mrs. Linton, who was very much excited, bade me accompany her upstairs. She did not know my share in contributing to the disturbance, and I was anxious to keep her in ignorance. "'I'm nearly distracted, Nelly," she exclaimed, throwing herself on the sofa. "'A thousand smith's hammers are beating in my head. Tell Isabella to shun me. This uproar is owing to her, and should she or any one else aggravate my anger at present, I shall get wild. And Nelly, say to Edgar, if you see him again to-night, that I'm in danger of being seriously ill. I wish it may prove true. He has startled and distressed me shockingly. I want to frighten him. Besides, he might come and begin a string of abuse or complainings. I'm certain I should recriminate, and God knows where we should end. Will you do so, my good Nelly? You are aware that I am in no way blamable in this matter. What possessed him to turn listener? Heathcliff's talk was outrageous after you left us, but I could soon have diverted him from Isabella, and the rest meant nothing. Now all is dashed wrong, by the fool's craving to hear evil of self, that haunts some people like a demon. Had Edgar never gathered our conversation, he would never have been the worse for it. Really, when he opened on me in that unreasonable tone of displeasure, after I had scolded Heathcliff till I was hoarse for him, I did not care hardly what they did to each other, especially as I felt that, however the scene closed, we should all be driven asunder, for nobody knows how long. Well, if I cannot keep Heathcliff for my friend, if Edgar will be mean and jealous, I'll try to break their hearts by breaking my own. That will be a prompt way of finishing all, when I am pushed to extremity but it's a deed to be reserved for a forlorn hope. I'd not take Linton by surprise with it. To this point he has been discreet in dreading to provoke me. You must represent the peril of quitting that policy, and remind him of my passionate temper, verging, when kindled, on frenzy. I wish you could dismiss that apathy out of that countenance, and look rather more anxious about me. The stolidity with which I received these instructions was, no doubt, rather exasperating for they were delivered in perfect sincerity, but I believed a person who could plan the turning of her fits of passion to account beforehand might, by exerting her will, manage to control herself tolerably, even while under their influence, and I did not wish to frighten her husband, as she said, and multiply his annoyances for the purpose of serving her selfishness. Therefore I said nothing when I met the master coming towards the parlour, but I took the liberty of turning back to listen whether they would resume their quarrel together. He began to speak first. "'Remain where you are, Catherine,' he said, without any anger in his voice, but with much sorrowful despondency. "'I shall not stay. I am neither come to wrangle nor to be reconciled, but I wish just to learn whether, after this evening's events, you intend to continue your intimacy with—' "'Oh, for mercy's sake!' interrupted the mistress, stamping her foot. "'For mercy's sake, let us hear no more of it now. Your cold blood cannot be worked into a fever.' Your veins are full of ice-water, but mine are boiling, and the sight of such chillness makes them dance. To get rid of me, answer my question, persevered Mr. Linton. You must answer it, and that violence does not alarm me. I have found that you can be as stoical as any one when you please. Will you give up Heathcliff hereafter, or will you give up me? It is impossible for you to be my friend and his at the same time and I absolutely require to know which you choose. I require to be let alone, exclaimed Catherine furiously. I demand it. Don't you see I can scarcely stand? Edgar, you—you you leave me. She rang the bell till it broke with a twang. I entered leisurely. It was enough to try the temper of a saint such senseless, wicked rages. There she lay dashing her head against the arm of the sofa and grinding her teeth so that you might fancy she would crash them to splinters. Mr. Linton stood looking at her in sudden compunction and fear. He told me to fetch some water. She had no breath for speaking. I brought a glass full, and as she would not drink I sprinkled it on her face. In a few seconds she stretched herself out stiff, and turned up her eyes. 
while her cheeks at once blanched and livid assumed the aspect of death. Linton looked terrified. There is nothing in the world the matter, I whispered. I did not want him to yield, though I could not help being afraid in my heart. She has blood on her lips, he said, shuddering. Never mind, I answered tartly. And I told him how she had resolved, previous to his coming, on exhibiting a fit of frenzy. I incautiously gave the account aloud, and she heard me, for she started up, her hair flying over her shoulders, her eyes flashing, the muscles of her neck and arms standing out preternaturally. I made up my mind for broken bones, at least, but she only glared about her for an instant, and then rushed from the room. The master directed me to follow. I did to her chamber door. She hindered me from going further by securing it against me. As she never offered to descend to breakfast next morning, I went to ask whether she would have some carried up. No, she replied peremptorily. The same question was repeated at dinner and tea, and again on the morrow after, and received the same answer. Mr. Linton, on his part, spent his time in the library, and did not inquire concerning his wife's occupations. Isabella and he had an hour's interview, during which he tried to elicit from her some sentiment of proper horror for Heathcliff's advances. But he could make nothing of her evasive replies, and was obliged to close the examination unsatisfactorily, adding, however, a solemn warning that if she were so insane as to encourage that worthless suitor, it would dissolve all bonds of relationship between herself and him. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. While Miss Linton moped about the park and garden, always silent and almost always in tears, and her brother shut himself up among books that he never opened, wearying, I guessed, with a continual vague expectation that Catherine, repenting her conduct, would come out of her own accord to ask pardon and seek a reconciliation and she fasted pertinaciously, under the idea, probably, that at every meal Edgar was ready to chalk for her absence, and pride alone held him from running to cast himself at her feet. I went about my household duties, convinced that the Grange had but one sensible soul in all its walls, and that lodged in my body. I wasted no condolences on Miss, nor any expostulations on my mistress, nor did I pay much attention to the sighs of my master, who yearned to hear his lady's name, since he might not hear her voice. I determined they should come about as they pleased for me, and though it was a tiresomely slow process, I began to rejoice at length in a faint dawn of its progress, as I thought at first. Mrs. Linton, on the third day, unbarred her door, and having finished the water in her pitcher and decanter, desired a renewed supply and a basin of gruel, for she believed she was dying. That I set down as a speech meant for Edgar's ears. I believed no such thing, so I kept it to myself, and brought her some tea and dry toast. She ate and drank eagerly, and sank back on her pillow again, clenching her hands and groaning. "'Oh, I will die!' she exclaimed. "'Since no one cares anything about me. I wish I had not taken that.' Then a good while after I heard her murmur, "'No, I'll not die. He'd be glad. He does not love me at all. He would never miss me.' "'Did you want anything, ma'am? I inquired, still preserving my external composure, in spite of her ghastly countenance and strange, exaggerated manner. "'What is that apathetic being doing?' she demanded, pushing the thick entangled locks from her wasted face. "'Has he fallen into a lethargy, or is he dead?' neither replied i if you mean mr linton he's tolerably well i think though his studies occupy him rather more than they ought he is continually among his books since he has no other society i should not have spoken so if i had known her true condition but i could not get rid of the notion that she acted a part of her disorder among his books she cried confounded and i dying i on the brink of the grave my god does he know how i'm altered continued she staring at her reflection in a mirror hanging against the opposite wall is that catherine linton he imagines me in a pet in play perhaps cannot you inform him that it is frightful earnest 
nelly if it be not too late as soon as i learn how he feels i'll choose between these two either to starve at once that would be no punishment unless he had a heart or to recover and leave the country are you speaking the truth about him now take care is he actually so utterly indifferent for my life why mum i answered the master has no idea of your being deranged and of course he does not fear that you will let yourself die of hunger you think not cannot you tell him i will she returned persuade him speak of your own mind say you are certain i will no you forget mrs linton i suggested that you have eaten some food with a relish this evening and to-morrow you will perceive its good effects if i were only sure it would kill him she interrupted i'd kill myself directly these three awful nights have never closed my lids and oh i've been tormented i've been haunted nelly but i begin to fancy you don't like me how strange i thought though everybody hated and despised each other they could not avoid loving me and they have all turned to enemies in a few hours they have i'm positive the people here how dreary to meet death surrounded by their cold faces isabella terrified and repelled afraid to enter the room it would be so dreadful to watch catherine go and edgar standing solemnly by to see it over then offering prayers of thanks to god for restoring peace to his house and going back to his books what in the name of all that feels has he to do with books when i am dying she could not bear the notion which i had put into her head of mr linton's philosophical resignation tossing about she increased her feverish bewilderment to madness and tore the pillow with her teeth then raising herself up all burning desired that i would open the window we were in the middle of winter the wind blew strong from the northeast and i objected both the expressions flitting over her face and the changes of her moods began to alarm me terribly and brought to my recollection her former illness and the doctor's injunction that she should not be crossed a minute previously she was violent now supported on one arm and not noticing my refusal to obey her she seemed to find childish diversion in pulling the feathers from the rents she had just made and ranging them on the sheet according to their different species her mind had strayed to other associations that's a turkey's she murmured to herself and this is a wild duck's and this is a pigeon's ah they put pigeon's feathers in the pillows no wonder i couldn't die let me take care to throw it on the floor when i lie down and here is a moorcock's and this i should know it among a thousand it's a lapwing's bonny bird wheeling over our heads in the middle of the moor it wanted to get to its nest for the clouds had touched the swells and it felt rain coming this feather was picked up from the heath the bird was not shot we saw its nest in the winter full of little skeletons heathcliff set a trap over it and the old ones dared not come i made him promise he'd never shoot a lapwing after that and he didn't yes here are more did he shoot my lapwings nelly are they red any of them let me look give over with that baby work i interrupted dragging the pillow away and turning the holes towards the mattress for she was removing its contents by handfuls lie down and shut your eyes you're wandering there's a mess the down is flying about like snow i went here and there collecting it i see in you nelly she continued dreamily an aged woman you have grey hair and bent shoulders this bed is the fairy cave under penistone crags and you are gathering elf bolts to hurt our heifers pretending while i am near that they are only locks of wool that's what you'll come to fifty years hence i know you are not so now i'm not wondering you're mistaken or else i should believe you really were that withered hag and i should think i was under penistone crags and i'm conscious it's night and there are two candles on the table making the black press shine like jet the black press where is that i asked you are talking in your sleep it's against the wall as it always is she replied it does appear odd i see a face in it there's no press in the room and never was said i 
resuming my seat and looping up the curtain that I might watch her. "'Don't you see that face?' she inquired, gazing earnestly at the mirror. And say what I could, I was incapable of making her comprehend it to be her own, so I rose and covered it with a shawl. "'It's behind there still,' she pursued anxiously. "'And it stirred. Who is it? I hope it will not come out when you are gone. Oh, Nelly, the room is haunted. I'm afraid of being alone.' I took her hand in mine, and bid her be composed, for a succession of shudders convulsed her frame, and she would keep straining her gaze towards the glass. "'There's nobody here,' I insisted. "'It was yourself, Miss Linton. You knew it a while since.' "'Myself!' she gasped. "'And the clock is striking twelve. It's true, then. That's dreadful.' Her fingers clutched the clothes, and gathered them over her eyes. I attempted to steal to the door with an intention of calling her husband, but I was summoned back by a piercing shriek. The shawl had dropped from the frame. "'Why, what is the matter?' cried I. "'Who is coward now? Wake up! That is the glass, the mirror, Mrs. Linton, and you see yourself in it, and there am I, too, by your side.' Trembling and bewildered, she held me fast, but the horror gradually passed from her countenance, its paleness gave place to a glow of shame. "'Oh, dear! I thought I was at home,' she sighed. "'I thought I was lying in my chamber at Wuthering Heights. Because I'm weak, my brain got confused, and I screamed unconsciously. Don't say anything, but stay with me. I dread sleeping. My dreams appal me.' "'A sound sleep would do you good, ma'am,' I answered and I hope this suffering will prevent your trying starving again. Oh, if I were but in my own bed, in the old house, she went on bitterly, wringing her hands, and that wind sounding in the firs by the lattice. Do let me feel it. It comes straight down the moor. Do let me have one breath. To pacify her, I held the casement ajar a few seconds. A cold blast rushed through. I closed it and returned to my post. She lay still now, her face bathed in tears. Exhaustion of body had entirely subdued her spirit. Our fiery Catherine was no better than a wailing child. "'How long is it since I shut myself in here?' she asked, suddenly reviving. "'It was Monday evening,' I replied, "'and this is Thursday night, or rather Friday morning at present.' "'What? Of the same week?' she exclaimed. "'Only that brief time?' "'Long enough to live on nothing but cold water and ill-temper,' observed I. "'Well, it seems a weary number of hours,' she muttered doubtfully. "'It must be more. I remember being in the parlour after they had quarrelled, and Edgar being cruelly provoking, and me running into this room desperate. As soon as ever I had barred the door, utter blackness overwhelmed me, and I fell on the floor.' I couldn't explain to Edgar how certain I felt of having a fit, or going raging mad, if he persisted in teasing me. I had no command of tongue, or brain, and he did not guess my agony, perhaps. It barely left me sense to try to escape from him and his voice. Before I recovered sufficiently to see and hear, it began to be dawn. And, Nelly, I'll tell you what I thought, and what is kept recurring and recurring till I feared for my reason. I thought— as I lay there, with my head against that table-leg, and my eyes dimly discerning the grey square of the window, that I was enclosed in the oak-panelled bed at home, and my heart ached with some great grief which, just waking, I could not recollect. I pondered and worried myself to discover what it could be, and most strangely, the whole last seven years of my life grew a blank. I did not recall that they had been at all. I was a child— my father was just buried, and my misery arose from the separation that Hindley had ordered between me and Heathcliff. I was laid alone, for the first time, and rousing from a dismal doze after a night of weeping, I lifted my hand to push the panels aside. It struck the table-top. I swept it along the carpet, and then memory burst in. My late anguish was swallowed in a paroxysm of despair. I cannot say why I felt so wildly wretched— it must have been temporary derangement, for there is scarcely cause. But, supposing at twelve years old I had been wrenched from the heights, and every early association, and my all in all, 
as Heathcliff was at that time, and been converted at a stroke into Mrs. Linton, the lady of Thrushcross Grange, and the wife of a stranger, in exile, and outcast, thenceforth, from what had been my world. You may fancy a glimpse of the abyss where I grovelled. Shake your head as you will, Nelly. You have helped to unsettle me. You should have spoken to Edgar, indeed you should, and compelled him to leave me quiet. Oh, I'm burning! I wish I were out of doors. I wish I were a girl again, half savage and hardy, and free, and laughing at injuries, not maddening under them. Why am I so changed? Why does my blood rush into a hell of tumult at a few words? I'm sure I should be myself, were I once among the heather on those hills. Open the window again wide. Fasten it open. Quick! Why don't you move? Because I won't give you your death of cold, I answered. You won't give me a chance of life, you mean, she said sullenly. However, I'm not helpless yet. I'll open it myself. And sliding from the bed before I could hinder her, she crossed the room, walking very uncertainly, threw it back, and bent out, careless of the frosty air that cut about her shoulders as keen as a knife. I entreated, and finally attempted to force her to retire, but soon found her delirious strength much surpassed mine. She was delirious. I became convinced by her subsequent actions and ravings. There was no moon, and everything beneath lay in misty darkness. Not a sight gleamed from any house, far or near, all had been extinguished long ago, and those at withering heights were never visible. Still, she asserted she caught their shining. Look! she cried eagerly. That's my room with the candle in it, and the trees swaying before it, and the other candle is in Joseph's garret. Joseph sits up late, doesn't he? He's waiting till I come home, that he may lock the gate. Well, he'll wait a while yet. It's a rough journey, and a sad heart to travel it and we must pass by Gimmert and Kirk to go that journey. We've braved its ghosts often together, and dared each other to stand among the graves and ask them to come. But Heathcliff, if I dare you now, will you venture? If you do, I'll keep you. I'll not lie there by myself. They may bury me twelve feet deep and throw the church down over me, but I won't rest till you are with me. I never will. She paused and resumed with a strange smile. He's considering. He'd rather I'd come to him. Find a way, then, not through that kirkyard. You are slow. Be content. You always followed me. Perceiving it vain to argue against her insanity, I was planning how I could reach something to wrap about her without quitting my hold of herself, for I could not trust her alone by the gaping lattice, when, to my consternation, I heard the rattle of the door-handle, and Mr. Linton entered. He had only then come from the library, and in passing through the lobby had noticed our talking, and been attracted by curiosity, or fear, to examine what it signified at that late hour. "'Oh, sir!' I cried, checking the exclamation risen to his lips at the sight which met him, and the bleak atmosphere of the chamber. "'My poor mistress is ill, and she quite masters me. I cannot manage her at all. Pray, come and persuade her to go to bed.' Forget your anger, for she's hard to guide any way but her own. Catherine ill? he said, hastening to us. Shut the window, Ellen. Catherine, why? He was silent. The haggardness of Mrs. Linton's appearance smote him speechless, and he could only glance from her to me in horrified astonishment. She's been fretting here, I continued, and eating scarcely anything, and never complaining. She would admit none of us till this evening, and so we couldn't inform you of her state, as we were not aware of it ourselves. But it is nothing. I felt I uttered my explanations awkwardly. The master frowned. It is nothing, is it, Ellen Dean? He said sternly. You shall account more clearly for keeping me ignorant of this. And he took his wife in his arms, and looked at her with anguish. At first she gave him no glance of recognition, he was invisible to her abstracted gaze. The delirium was not fixed, however, having weaned her eyes from contemplating the outer darkness. By degrees she centred her attention on him, and discovered who it was that held her. "'Ah, you are come, are you, Edgar Linton?' she said, with angry animation. "'You are one of those things that are ever found when least wanted, and when you are wanted, never. I suppose we shall have plenty of lamentations now.' 
I see we shall. But they can't keep me from my narrow home out yonder, my resting-place, where I'm bound before spring is over. There it is, not among the Lintons, mind, under the chapel roof, but in the open air, with a headstone, and you may please yourself whether you go to them or come to me. Catherine, what have you done? Commenced the muster. Am I nothing to you any more? Do you love that wretch Heath? Hush! cried Mrs. Linton. Hush! this moment! You mention that name, and I end the matter instantly by a spring from the window. What you touch at present you may have, but my soul will be on that hilltop before you lay hands on me again. I don't want you, Edgar. I'm past wanting you. Return to your books. I'm glad you possess a consolation, for all you had in me is gone. Her mind wanders, sir, I interposed. She has been talking nonsense the whole evening, but let her have her quiet and proper attendance, and she'll rally. Hereafter we must be cautious how we vex her. I desire no further advice from you, answered Mr. Linton. You knew your mistress's nature, and you encourage me to harass her, and not to give me one hint of how she's been these three days. It was heartless. Months of sickness could not cause such a change. I began to defend myself, thinking it too bad to be blamed for another's wicked waywardness. I knew Mrs. Linton's nature to be headstrong and domineering, cried I, but I didn't know that you wished to foster her fierce temper. I didn't know that, to humour her, I should wink at Mr. Heathcliff. I performed the duty of a faithful servant in telling you, and I have got a faithful servant's wages. Well, it will teach me to be careful next time. Next time you may gather intelligence for yourself. The next time you bring a tale to me, you shall quit my service, Ellen Dean, he replied. You'd rather hear nothing about it, I suppose, than Mr. Linton, said I. Heathcliff has your permission to come a-courting to Miss, and to drop in at every opportunity your absence offers, on purpose to poison the mistress against you. Confused as Catherine was, her wits were alert at applying our conversation. Ah! Oh, Nelly has played traitor! she exclaimed passionately. Nelly is my hidden enemy, you witch! So you do seek elf bolts to hurt us. Let me go, and I'll make her rue. I'll make her howl a recantation. A maniac's fury kindled under her brows. She struggled desperately to disengage herself from Linton's arms. I felt no inclination to tarry the event, and, resolving to seek medical aid on my own responsibility, I quitted the chamber. In passing the garden to reach the road, at a place where a bridle hook is driven into the wall, I saw something white move irregularly, evidently by another agent than the wind. Notwithstanding my hurry, I stayed to examine it, lest ever after I should have the conviction impressed on my imagination that it was a creature of the other world. My surprise and perplexity were great on discovering by touch more than vision Miss Isabella's springer, Fanny, suspended by a handkerchief and nearly at its last gasp. I quickly released the animal and lifted it into the garden. I had seen it follow its mistress upstairs when she went to bed, and wondered much how it could have got out there, and what mischievous person had treated it so. While untying the knot around the hook, it seemed to me that I repeatedly caught the beat of horses' feet galloping at some distance, but there were such a number of things to occupy my reflections that I hardly gave the circumstance a thought, though it was a strange sound in that place at two o'clock in the morning. Mr. Kenneth was fortunately just issuing from his house to see a patient in the village as I came up the street, and my account of Catherine Linton's malady induced him to accompany me back immediately. He was a plain, rough man, and he made no scruple to speak his doubts of her surviving this second attack, unless she were more submissive to his directions than she had shown herself before. Melodine, said he, I can't help fancying there's an extra cause for this. What has there been to do at the Grange? We've all reports up here. A stout, hearty lass like Catherine does not fall ill for a trifle, and that sort of people should not either. It's hard work bringing them through fevers and such things. How did it begin? The master will inform you, I answered. 
but you are acquainted with the Earnshaw's violent dispositions, and Mrs. Lenton caps them all. I may say this, it commenced in a quarrel. She was struck, during a tempest of passion, with a kind of fit. That's her account, at least, for she flew off in the height of it, and locked herself up. Afterwards she refused to eat, and now she alternately raves and remains in a half-dream, knowing those about her, but having her mind filled with all sorts of strange ideas and illusions. "'Mr. Linton will be sorry,' observed Kenneth interrogatively. "'Sorry? He'll break his heart should anything happen,' I replied. "'Don't alarm him more than necessary.' "'Well, I told him to beware,' said my companion. "'And he must bide the consequences of neglecting me warning. "'Hasn't he been intimate with Mr. Heathcliff lately?' "'Heathcliff frequently visits at the Grange,' answered I, "'the more on the strength of the mistress having known him when he was a boy "'than because the master likes his company. "'At present he's discharged from the trouble of calling, "'owing to some presumptuous aspirations after Miss Linton, which he manifested. "'I hardly think he'll be taken in again.' "'And does Miss Linton turn a cold shoulder on him?' was the doctor's next question. "'I'm not in her confidence,' returned I, reluctant to continue the subject. "'No, she's a sly one,' he remarked, shaking his head. "'She keeps her own counsel. But she's a real little fool. I have it from good authority that last night, and a pretty night it was, she and Heathcliff were walking in the plantation at the back of your house above two hours, and he pressed her not to go in again, but just mount his horse and away with him. My informant said she could only put him off by pledging her word of honor to be prepared on their first meeting after that. When it was, he didn't hear. But you urge Mr. Linton to look sharp. The news filled me with fresh fears. I outstripped Kenneth and ran most of the way back. The little dog was yelping in the garden yet. I spared a minute to open the gate for it, but instead of going to the house door, it coursed up and down, snuffing the grass, and would have escaped to the road had I not seized it and conveyed it in with me. On ascending to Isabella's room, my suspicions were confirmed. It was empty. Had I been a few hours sooner, Mrs. Linton's illness might have arrested her rash step. But what could be done now? There was a bare possibility of overtaking them if pursued instantly. I could not pursue them, however, and I dared not rouse the family and fill the place with confusion, still less unfold the business to my master, absorbed as he was in his present calamity, and having no heart to spare for a second grief. I saw nothing for it but to hold my tongue, and suffer matters to take their course, and Kenneth being arrived, I went with a badly composed countenance to announce him. Catherine lay in a troubled sleep. Her husband had succeeded in soothing the excess of frenzy. He now hung over her pillow, watching every shade and every change of her painfully expressive features. The doctor, on examining the case for himself, spoke hopefully to him of its having a favourable termination, if we could only preserve around her a perfect and constant tranquillity. To me, he signified, the threatening danger was not so much death as permanent alienation of intellect. I did not close my eyes that night, nor did Mr. Linton. Indeed, we never went to bed, and the servants were all up long before the usual hour, moving through the house with stealthy tread, and exchanging whispers as they encountered each other in their vocations. Everyone was active but Miss Isabella, and they began to remark how sound she slept, her brother, too, asked if she had risen, and seemed impatient for her presence, and hurt that she showed so little anxiety for her sister-in-law. I trembled lest he should send me to call her, but I was spared the pain of being the first proclaimant of her flight. One of the maids, a thoughtless girl, who had been on an early errand to Gimmerton, came panting upstairs, open-mouthed, and dashed into the chamber, crying, "'Oh, dear, dear, what mun we have next? Master, master, our young lady!' "'Hold your noise!' cried I hastily, enraged at her clamorous manner. "'Speak lower, Mary. What is the matter?' said Mr. Linton. "'What ails your young lady?' "'She's gone! She's gone! Your Heathcliff's run off with her!' gasped the girl. "'That is not true!' exclaimed Linton, rising in agitation. 
it cannot be how has the idea entered your head ellen dean go and seek her it is incredible it cannot be as he spoke he took the servant to the door and then repeated his demand to know her reasons for such an assertion why i met on the road a lad that fetches milk here she stammered and he asked whether we weren't in trouble at the grange i thought he meant for mrs sickness so i answered yes then says he there's somebody gone after him i guess i stared i saw he knew not about it and he told how a gentleman and lady had stopped to have a horse's shoe fastened at a blacksmith's shop two miles out of gimmerton not very long after midnight and how the blacksmith's lass had got up to spy who they were she knew them both directly and she noticed the man heathcliff it was she felt certain nobody could mistake him besides put a sovereign in her father's hand for payment the lady had a cloak about her face but having desired a sup of water while she drank it fell back and she saw her very plain heathcliff held both bridles as they rode on and they set their faces from the village and went as fast as the rough roads would let them the lass said nothing to her father but she told it all over gimmerton this morning i ran and peeped for form's sake into isabella's room confirming when i returned the servant's statement mr linton had resumed his seat by the bed on my re-entrance he raised his eyes read the meaning of my blank aspect and dropped them without giving an order or uttering a word are we to try any measures for overtaking and bringing her back i inquired how should we do she went of her own accord answered the master she had a right to go if she pleased trouble me no more about her hereafter she is only my sister in name not because i disown her but because she has disowned me and that was all he said on the subject he did not make a single inquiry further or mention her in any way except directing me to send what property she had in the house to her fresh home wherever it was when i knew it End of chapter 12